Uh, my name is Pimp Daddy Supreme, and welcome to Masters of MASH. As you know, Twitch is a, a new fertile ground for which to uh, have our experiments, our interviews, and our DJ sets. And uh, I'm doing my best I can, the best I can to uh, bring you uh, stuff that you just wouldn't see anywhere else. Uh, that being said, uh, today's guest is a man named John Nelson. He was behind uh, the nationally syndicated radio show Some Assembly Required. The, it was a sample-based music and audio art show focusing on artists who choose to work with samples and pre-recorded work to create sound collage, tape, manip tape manipulations, digital deconstructions, and turntable creations. It, it turned out to be a fertile ground for uh, documenting the, the scene as it was, not just for sound collage artists, but also for mashup artists. And we can, we can argue whether uh, or not if both are the same, um, as well as whether the term mashup actually covers both of those areas uh, and what the delineation there is. Um, but that being said, uh, before we get started, uh, one more tidbit of information. John Nelson's behind the Sound Collage Project Escape Mechanism. I'm going to start off with a uh, video from his first album. Uh, this song's called Culture. Got a taste for something new? For everyone. Where these deformed frogs are? It's a million laughs. Oh, man. A new obsession is growing strong. For a truly authentic flavor. And the season just beginning to Deodorant salesman. Oh, right between the eyes. Well, Wrestlers. Look at the blood just spewing out of the forehead. You're going to feel the feel. You're going to feel Beauty contest, the talk show. Our third finalist. Beauty contest, the talk show. Let the audience have a good look at it. The whole culture. It's up to the judge. Hot chunks for the magazine's annual sexy stars issue. Nazis. He's sexy in his own right. That's our live top story company. I think it's kind of cool. Deodorant you know, salesman. You know, three rough legs, three eyes, or just something strange, you know. Beauty contest, the talk show. We'll be back right after the beauty contest, the talk show. Culture. First prize, Bob, an incandescent organized Culture. event has eight separate compartments raised. Reality or fantasy. Strange. Do you believe that that prize is thirteen dollars? It's been ages since I sat in front of the TV. First to form frogs are found available in. now on home. Video. Just changing channels to find something. Co-star Costa posed both with his pants and without for the. You see the whole culture. And now to look at the deformed frogs, and he's. You see the whole culture. Tender and tangy. Soon after she left, did I bet you wonder uh, who I am. You read my mind. I did. I'm psychic. <laughs> Reports of abnormal frogs. Deodorant salesman. Outrageously juicy. Very looking frogs like these. Wrestlers. The blood just pouring out of the forehead. Yeah, I felt the fury. Now finally ringing once again. Beauty That's contest, the talk show. More deformed frogs. Beauty contest, the talk show. Moments we've all been waiting for. The whole culture. The final judge's decision. Oh, it's really been a growing mystery. Tonight, finally, well, officials have one answer, count. but it doesn't make anyone in this area feel any better. Can you imagine the level of the mind that watches this? Yeah, I can't wait to see you go down. Culture. What you gonna do? Culture. Strange phenomenon that spread beyond me. Nazis. There's nothing I can do to stop you, is there? Deodorant salesman. Hey, what about him, though? You abandoned him, so he's going to find someone else. Wait, what, what even... Beauty contest, the talk show. Fourth runner-up. Beauty contest, the talk show. So you and I are Culture. together. We can win this game. Culture. We can win it clean. Forget clean. I said win. <laughs> Large numbers of deformed frogs. The most important thing is I win. <laughs> But the worst are the fundamentalist creatures. And if you break the laws of God Almighty, third-rate con men, you'll have to suffer the hellish, horrible, tedious consequences. Telling the poor suckers that watch them because of the sins, the sins. You hear me? That they speak for Jesus. The Lord is speaking to me right now. Isn't that just like the devil? And to please send in money. Thank you. Jesus. Money, money, money. So because he is Satan. It's all about Satan. The devil plays for keeps. If Jesus came back. He wants to damn you, to destroy you, to steal you, to kill you. And so what's going on in his name? To desecrate. The Lord God Almighty has spoken to me. You're evil. Evil. It never stops growing up. Evil genius. Oh, well, thank you. God, would you please lighten up? I'm really not in the mood to hear a review of contemporary society again. Once again, that was Escape Mechanism, a.k.a. John Nelson, uh, with his uh, song Culture, or track, 
culture from his self-titled uh, album, uh, Escape Mechanism. Uh, that being said, uh, just to give a little insight as to what you've seen, uh, it's very obviously a sound collage. Uh, some would some would argue that's a mashup, uh, but we'll get into that here in this uh, this interview. But to give you some insight as to what he's trying to, to do here, um, let's look at his let's look to his name. Uh, his name is uh, Escape Mechanism, which uh, Merriam-Webster defines as uh, a means of unavoiding an unpleasant life situation as daydreaming, a mode of behavior or thinking adopted to evade unpleasant facts or responsibilities. Uh, to answer these questions and more as well as to talk about how he, his nationally syndicated radio show, uh, helped an entire decade, a generation, if you, if you will, uh, a generation's worth of uh, mashup artists uh, covering some of the top mashup artists of the time. Uh, here is the host of Some Assembly Required, John Nelson. Hi, John. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Where, where, where are we calling you from? Where are you located right now? I am in Portland, Oregon. Excellent, excellent. Which is, which is quite a far away, far away from uh, where you hosted the show, which was uh, the Twin Cities, right? That's right, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, now that being said, uh, we're just going to jump right into it because we found that uh, with this show, uh, there's so much to cover that uh, we usually wind up uh, skipping over stuff. So uh, we're just going to get right into it. Where were you born? Uh, I was born in Dallas, Texas mm -hmm. in the 70s and moved up to Minnesota with my mom and dad, obviously, when I was in the, it was the summer of between first and second grade. Awesome. And so so wait a second. You, you said you moved where in first and second grade? We moved to – it was the suburbs of Minneapolis. Suburbs of Minneapolis, right. Now, your, your mother was a, a, a folk musician – that played the uh, hammer dulcimer. Is that correct? Yeah, she was a stay-at-home mom, but she she was a, an amateur folk musician. Yeah. And your father was an electrical engineer. Yes. So it's like I can't help but see some of this assemblage and the dream at dream like aspects of you know the hammer dulcimer, the the dulcet tones of that the that kind of music uh, interwoven within your work, um, especially you know like a some of the some of the tracks from uh, your your first album specifically um now that being said one of the things that i think also ties into not just your music but your show um is you were uh, an avid journaler um your your mom who who taught you how to journal i always watched my mom keeping a diary and i think i just wanted one and she bought me one and I never stopped writing in it. And uh, the question <laughs> is is that with your with your stated artist uh, name escape mechanism being focused on daydreams, when did you start I'm, and I'm speculating here, when did you start your dream journal? Oh, I just think it I don't think I had a specific dream journal. Oh, okay. I definitely Yeah, I wrote about my dreams in my journal, but I didn't have <laughs> dream journal i'm thinking of somebody else who did i think uh, anyway but no i didn't have one okay but 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 you you very much said like it, it's that you didn't separate the two you no. you fused them together you 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 know pulled it together the same way that you pull everything together into your work yep. um i just it was in my head yeah so that being said uh you know now that we've tied together like pretty much like you know this this and and for those of you who don't don't know um you can look up his website uh the uh, some assembly required not to be confused with the television show some assembly required that will come up when you uh google some assembly required make sure you google some assembly required john nelson uh or what what's the full regular uh, web address for sensory uh, or for uh, some assembly required some dash assembly dash required dot net okay now, and that being said, uh, you know you can get there there, or you can you can do John J O N Nelson, and uh, some assembly required in Google, and also get the same thing in case you know the hyphens you know, get in your way. Uh, but that being said, his website is a meticulous resource uh, for sound artists uh, prominent in their field, um, as well as mashup artists uh, are concerned. Um, 
and we'll get into that here in a little bit. Um, but again, in your childhood, you moved around a lot. Uh, you, you moved from, <coughs> from Dallas to Minneapolis and then, uh, or actually before I get into where you moved next, I'm sorry, we should talk about, uh, another thing that you started doing other than just journaling. Your dad had a reel to reel machine. Yeah. And how did he, how did, uh, what, what was, uh, what was the way that he used that in uh, a, a, in a legal fashion that we had, we had talked about previously? Oh, I don't remember talking about that with you earlier. We were talking about making cassette dubs. Yes. Yes. Well, I mean, again, 1980s parlance, you know, home taping is killing music. Uh, the question being is, you know, some would say it's, illegal some would say it's not yeah was was that an influence to you as far as like learning to tape uh sounds hmm i don't i can't i don't think so no (laughs) i definitely made copies i had a, a big library of music i mean that's what i used the tapes for right you know that's what we were doing was building up our our libraries did your did your dad ever teach you how to like fix a broken tape? Like where did you learn? Because you you had stated that you uh, you later used reel to reel and splice blocks oh, yeah. and whatnot to edit audio. When I got to college, it, there was a I had a four track uh, whatever the brand was a four track reel to reel where you have to talk you know jog the reels back and forth and you get the tape. Just where you, 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 you learn how to pause it right where you want it, pull it off and use a wax pencil. Oh, that's right. You use the wax pencil to mark it and then pull it off. And but it's a lot better than deposit it on the dual cassette tape deck, what I was doing. As a well, kid. did your did your dad teach you any of those skills as far as like, you know, how to mark a tape and splice it and edit it together? I don't think so. No. Okay. No, he, he taught me how to use a pencil to, to rewind a cassette. but. <laughs> And when did you get your first cassette deck? Oh, yeah. That's probably true. In fact, I, this, I just bought it on eBay recently. It, this is the cassette. Wow. The cassette. Okay, yes. My dad had this one. We made That's where, that's where we made all of our uh, childhood radio shows that I was telling you about. <laughs> so that, that's something that like I personally uh, like 100% um, – identify with is this this child uh, of the of our time period you know the late 70s early 80s uh where we're you know stuck you know listening to a handful of uh television stations and maybe you know the radio in the car or whatever else like that and our need to emulate the world around us uh and that for me that that came up as as making fake radio shows and pretending to be an announcer and announcing songs and you you say that you yeah. did the same thing I did. I've, in fact, completely coincidentally, it has nothing to do with having to talk to you this morning or looking forward to talking to you this morning. I just finished digitizing a bunch of that stuff, and some of it's really good. Some of it's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun at the time, man. It was fun to digitize it today, it was the past week or so. Well, I mean, what you're doing is you're, you're going through your archives. I'm sure even some of the best musicians have hours and hours of tape of just pure crap. And, you know, you- yeah. That's where curation um, comes in, which is, yeah. which is something you know about. Uh, and we'll get into that here later because, you know, you, you ran a record label. Um, but that being said, uh, when we talk about, you know, you and that early cassette deck and you're there around the house, what are you recording? What are other than, you know, when you're doing your radio show at the age of like, what, eight or nine years old? How old were you? Uh, yeah, somewhere around there, between eight and twelve, eight and eleven, maybe. Mm-hmm. And and so, what what were you running around recording? What 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 interested you? What kinds of music was I playing? Yeah, were were you recording just music, or were you recording like? Yeah, I was doing a straight radio show. It was like me and my brother, and since it was pre-recorded, it was not you know obviously it's pre-recorded. Uh, <laughs> You could hear me pressing pause. And now here's my brother. Pause. Hey, this is John's brother. <laughs> you know, 
it was it was, it was cute. Did <laughs> did you ever uh, one of the things that I I love to do is uh, did you ever like impersonate like other celebrities to do celebrity interviews? No, did you? do Oh, that? totally, totally. I've got. Uh, I I would like rope my friends in, like my friend Tiffany uh, up in uh, Medina, New York. I had her on t- to one of my early shows uh, at that about that same age, and she pretended to be Dolly Parton. I remember that very vividly. Uh, um, now that being said, at some point you turned this home taping and radio show thing into recording snippets of television and making. Mm collage mixtapes for friends at an early age what what time period was this and and what what led to the to you doing this uh when did um pump up no what was that song that i was telling you about my memories oh probably uh was it mars uh by mars uh pump up pump up the pump up the volume oh pump up the volume whenever that was on the radio that would have been when it occurred to me that I could take the recordings that I was already making. I loved to make tapes of the TV shows that I was mm-hmm. listening to, you know, like my favorite little pieces from, you know, I, I have, I found a tape last night and it's, and I'm pretty sure that I made this tape before I had ever heard any Dickie Goodman. And it's like, and it's me. And I say, Captain Picard, I'm looking for this thing. And then you hear, John Luke Picard say, well, what is it you're looking for? <laughs> and then I get back on and say, well, it has something to do. And I, I made this little conversation with uh, Patrick Stewart. <laughs> that is fantastic. If you ever digitize that, I need to hear that. Oh, no. What was it? Uh, I, I'm not saying I'm not saying that, you know, you need to put that up public, publicly, but you and I need to do some like tape trading of our own, of our old, old uh, kids recordings. Cause uh, some of my kids recordings are out there public already. And have gotten like a, uh, you know, passed around the college radio slash independent like a uh, low power radio circuit. But uh, but yeah, I would I would love to hear that because I mean it's you <clears throat> as a kid doing what kids do and that kids still do to this day on YouTube and uh, via their recording apps uh, on their phone is they're interacting with the culture that is basically a dominant force in their life. Like no matter how hard you try to get away from it. Like you've got commercials, you've got songs, you've got television programs, you've got news all blaring at you from all angles. And it's only natural for you to want to be able to speak back or to be able to interact with all of this that goes on around you. Um, now, that being said, and we'll, and we'll get into the illegal nature of doing so, of daring to speak back, uh, especially their own words back at them uh, later. Uh, but that being said... Uh, you started to not only make these recordings, but you started to pass them around to friends. Do you remember what your friends said to you when they uh, first heard some of the things you were making? Mm, you know, I think they were polite. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I say that in retrospect because I was, like I said, literally just, I finally got through all the childhood stuff, like the, like I told you, the fake radio shows and the Dickie Goodman-esque cut up with Patrick Stewart. And I got to that a mix that I had made everyone in my graduating class senior year. Um, it was like a mixtape, which I really thought was like an album. There's like a picture of me on the cover. <laughs> you know. And uh, I listened to it and it, whew, I don't know. How, how many copies of that did you make? Probably, uh, probably like 20. I had a lot of friends that year. I was I didn't have a lot of friends in uh, high school generally, but I uh, switched to a public school my senior year, and so that was a an experience for me. But what I did was I I I, I uh, took that pause edit approach that you know everyone you know I certainly are familiar yes. with, and uh, I remixed every song that I put on this tape, and it's just you know. Basically, from my perspective now, what I did was butcher all these good songs, you know, because it's like, it's just a part that's supposed to be 10 seconds gets looped for an, a minute, and then you get the song again, and it's like, all right, I understand what I was doing. I was, I loved that song so much, I just wanted it to go on and on. But anyway, they, nobody complained, and I got a few compliments. So, 
things definitely went from I, there. I can't help but like just literally recognize that like while while you're embarrassed about doing something that basically created hip hop, um, you know, it, that 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 cre- that that's exactly the the thing that uh, that created hip hop is you know taking a song, identifying the get down part or the part that they loved the most, and extending it. Uh, and so that it yeah. goes on for uh, forever, for as long as you want it to go on. That's true. I, I, did, create- I, I did create hip-hop. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> well, I'm not saying you're Columbusing hip-hop, but what I am saying is that, is that these, these, kind of, uh, these kind of things are, are, are natural. I like even today on YouTube, you can look up uh, people who have taken their favorite meme or whatnot and made the 10-hour version because of the limitations, you know, of like, you can only make a video that's 10 hours or whatnot. Like, they'd make it go on forever if they could. Um, and a single, You were telling about this, a single song yeah. I haven't seen. Yeah, no, just, just, just Google 10-hour version on, on YouTube and you'll come up with tons of memes and songs and jokes that just go on on a loop for 10 hours. Um, is it literally the same loop though? Or well, so some are change? seamless and some are just literally just disjointed loops, you know, over and over and <laughs> over again. It depends on like, you know, how, how well you, the per- or how much detail the person puts into it, how much effort the person puts into it. Um, another thing that, and, and I know that most of the people, the viewers that uh, tune into this show, uh, at least the live version of the show, uh, understand a lot of these concepts. Know who Dickie Goodman is, who is you know one of the, the creators of the Break In record, where you know you take popular songs and then arrange snippets of them to create a, a story or a storytelling device, uh, usually in the form of, uh, starting in the form of a news broadcast. Uh, it was a 1950s novelty record phase, uh, but very specifically, um, one of the things that we cover on this show and that we're covering today is the fact is that. Due to you know the generations that we we grew up in, John and myself, um, and even when we talk about you know the young kids of today, is that the tools of creation and the formats that they use uh, or that we use uh, become super fond. We're very fond of them. Um, they they work their way into our nostalgia and into our hearts, um, and because uh, they taught us how to communicate, or they allowed us to communicate. I should say, not taught us how we. We learned how to use those tools, um, and then then the format themselves brings a an aesthetic to the the work itself too. Um, could you speak a little bit more? I'm I'm assuming that you also uh, might feel the same way I do about the sound uh, and shape of a cassette and how it affects the art, uh, as well as uh, say something like you know uh, film or VHS. Um, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I can tell you this. I tried real hard to remove the tape hiss from those recordings, and it doesn't come out easily. I, it ends up being all echoey and weird if you take it out too aggressively. And I'm not. What do, What do you? What should I speak to specifically? Oh, just specifically, like formatism. Like I know that I know. Uh, looking into your your history, that you're you're a big fan of like the the early uh, theater. Uh, like film movie houses and stuff like that. Mm, I love old movie and, houses. And I'm assuming yeah. that part of that, and and I see this in some of the videos, which I, I I don't. The videos weren't made particularly by you, were they? I didn't make any of the videos. Okay. No. Well, with with the videos, they all they all use uh you know old television sets or very specifically like the play uh, iconography from like a VHS uh, player. Uh, or yeah. certain That's static or warbles or things like that, and I know that film gives the same kind of kind of aesthetic. Does does none of that really drive your work? Oh yeah, I mean, I like the I like what did I say recently on social media? I I just love it when the studio techniques are are not hidden; they're like super obvious. You know, where it's like it's skipping and slowing down and running backwards and. One of the tapes I found was I had recorded some late night DJ broadcasting from uh, I forget, but it used to be Duffy's in Minneapolis, and then it turned into more of a disco. And that's where this local radio station that I would listen to would broadcast from on the weekends, I assume. 
and that's where I first heard the records being blended together. You know, they were like the song that I knew was was melting and reforming and and combining with the song that was coming after it. And I assumed when I was recalling that memory recently to someone that it wouldn't sound as good as I remembered it sounding. And that was sometimes true. But some of these recordings that I made, I assumed they were doing some of that live because it was really funky. And I'm like, I can't imagine they actually put that out on a record. It was just... It almost sounded collage They would take like little pieces and just have them go beep, beep, beep <laughs> over and over. I wish I could play it for you, but I don't, I don't think there's any way to do that. Well, I mean, I, I will say that like uh, a lot of the DJ work, and especially when we talk about uh, people that you're intimately familiar with, like Steinsky, um, are able mm-hmm. to create sound, danceable sound collages that basically yeah. become, you know, just regular songs. Uh, and... And when we talk about, and this is this is what I was saying earlier in the show, is that when we talk about sound collage versus, uh, you know, a DJ blends or a producer, per, you know, sample based music and mashups, uh, they are mm-hmm. definitely all part of the same family. Um, and you can you can argue, you know, uh, what belongs where, dependingly, like. <laughs> I, I played them all on the show, one right after the other. You you specifically had three terms that you used on your show, though. Uh, turntable, what were they? Uh, tape manipulations, digital deconstructions, and turntable creations. That was my catchphrase that I was. What made proud you of. What made you identify those in particular? Because they were the three uh, playback pieces of equipment. The, the three pieces of playback equipment that you could manhandle, <laughs> person handle, and uh, turn into musical instruments. That's great. You know they, you know they weren't designed originally for creativity. They were designed for playback. But all of the artists that I was playing were you know, turning that on its head. Yeah, when you when you were talking about, uh, and just to go back to uh, your your tapes. Uh, in you know your your high school years and your your the things that you played for kids, I found a quote on uh, online from a previous interview where you said, "I would rent movies and tape dialogue, use Radio Shack microphones. I went through my dad's record collection and found his Bill Cosby records. Took stuff off of those. What what w- w- some people, especially uh, some sectors uh, of audio collagists, uh, want to be." taken seriously what made you bring comedy into some of your your work well um it's okay if i sit back (laughs) one of the things i can one of the things that comes to mind immediately when you say that is that i actually do take comedy pretty seriously so i don't think of it as as uh you know it's a, a comedy i have a lot of reverence for comedy and comedians so I never thought of it as as lowering the art form by including a a comedian. Oh, and I, I, I was definitely not in, not insisting that. If anything, you were no, know, you yeah. s- spoke eloquently to uh, exactly what I was uh, hoping you would say, and that is is that you know novelty and comedy doesn't necessarily make something dismissible. It, it if anything, yeah. it can bring more more reverence to and more insight to the things that you're you're creating. There are you know. Re- uh, Sometimes you sample something to, you know, ridicule it, and sometimes you sample something to highlight the, you know, the initial brilliance that was already there. And of course, you hope, hopefully, you make it your own by manipulating it and right. initiate a transformative effect. What was it? Uh, and I think that what you were saying also speaks to that there is a lot of truth in comedy. Definitely, they're the. Uh, well, it's kind of a hacky thing to say nowadays, but there the, there are gener- maybe the previous generation's philosophers. Now maybe it's um, TED Talkers. <laughs> <laughs> They're the ones who are you know not afraid to just. I try to do that on Facebook, and it's just like uh, crickets. Well, I, I think the key <laughs> but, is that not everyone can be a philosopher. A lot of people try. 
And now that everyone has uh, the uh, the ability to get online and say their piece, and they feel pushed to be, you know, to have an opinion. <clears throat> pardon me. They, uh, you know, again, you can't look to everyone for wisdom, but there mm-hmm. are those the, the, that find them, and then even uh, those like yourself that are able to take people who might not necessarily have the the truth or the wisdom that you seek, but be able to uh, at least take snippets of what they say to highlight or uh, highlight actual truth or, or critique the uh, the message that the person is saying. Yeah, I think sometimes I was taking their original message and maybe through editing and adding other materials, I was bringing out their message and making it even more obvious. That's what I was... I'm thinking of like certain artists in particular, certain comedians. Um, But yeah, I think what you said is right. Well, here's the other question is that you, uh, again, grew up in the Twin Cities in the 80s. What kind of influence was Prince on you? Well, aside from going to junior high school in in North Minneapolis, which was a very new experience for a suburban kid, (laughs) um, I would say that my first experience of Prince was, was hearing him on the radio when I worked at the sandwich shop, you know, about midway between my house. At that point, we lived in, in Crystal, which wasn't too far of a drive from where I went to school in North Minneapolis. And I worked at a sandwich shop in between those two points. And But I can tell you, I was a fan right away, you know. He probably got played more than he did in other cities, I don't know, just because of the hometown connection right right did you see any of the uh the moral outrage uh for what he you know was bringing forth as far as his imagery and stuff like that in your community oh sure yeah i mean i went to a very conservative uh religious school it was a christian school down in um i want to say i don't remember where it was but it was in north minneapolis and sure, they didn't mention him by name, but he was for sure the one they were talking about when they talked about, you know, how the world had gone off the rails, <laughs> which is what they were telling us every day. And, and I'm assuming you did not agree with them. No, not later on. And even when I was younger, I, I, I've always been sort of the devil's advocate. You know, I always question everything. It drives my wife crazy. <laughs> And I'm sure it drove my teachers crazy even back then. My parents, my son, everybody. <laughs> I always have to, well, let's think about the other side. We we did that the other day. We were talking about something, and I was presenting the other side, and you thought that was my perspective. I just I do that in, in every situation. And just, yeah, and I mean, it's... It, it, is, it is good, and, and again, it's themes that you see within sound collage and even in mashups where, you know, someone wants to, uh, you know, take somebody down or, or wants to lift somebody up. And, you know, you rearrange these messages and, or juxtapose these things to highlight uh, stuff and speak out. So it, 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 as Timothy Leary once said, uh, was it a sp- sp- think for yourself and question authority? As absolutely something that was taught to me at a very and young I, age. Yeah. Are, are there any quotes like that that, a, that uh that drive you that you know embedded in your brain when you were when you were younger? No, not when I was younger. I think I had a button that said, "I don't think much, therefore I might not be." <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was just I was yeah very 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 sheltered kid. It's. That was very much driven home by those tapes I was digitizing. So you were sheltered in Minneapolis, uh, again, born in Texas, at a young age, moved to to Minneapolis. At the age of 17, you finished up your high school in Chicago. How was that as far as like a a broadening experience? The suburbs of Chicago. But yeah, we would drive into the city whenever we had the chance. And it was, a, you know, my world... Uh, blew up and came back together in a 
scary and uh, exciting way. I was really depressed prior to that, you know, but I got to see that, you know, I don't know, like I was telling you before, the schools I went to were very repressive and conservative, and hopefully we won't spend no, the whole no, 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 no. But by the time I got to that senior year, it was, it was, yeah, it was a wake up to what the world really looked like. Right. Well, I mean, uh, uh, again, sorry to, to tread into any uh, comfortable area where you might be uh, uncomfortable talking about your personal life. But that being said, no, I, uh, uh, I think it is important like to talk to about, uh, you know, uh, things that, that oppress us uh, to show, to highlight that a lot of the, even even the silliest of songs that are within, you know, sound collage and, and within the mashup world and in, in turntablism even um, are, are uh, what do you call it, um, stem from a need to rebel uh, against you know the generations that came before us, some of the oppressive structures, some of the the things, mm-hmm. something to you know, it, it's a, a scream for freedom, in a way. Um, now to to move on, <laughs> uh, in uh, in nineteen ninety two, you actually made your you set out to make your own collage with a theme and an arc. Can you talk more about that? Uh, that was, I just remember I'd been doing that all through high school and, and really you're probably talking about the last one I did. And that's because I pushed it about as far as I could go with the, the linear pause edit collage approach that I was using. And well, actually that's not true. Cause I've heard a lot of people since then who are using that same approach and did it way better than I was doing. So I could have used my imagination and taken it a lot further. And instead I said, well, I can't do it as well as I'd like and quit, which was maybe unfortunate, but, uh, you know, I was waiting for the right tools. Right. And Cause at the time you only had the uh, dual cassette deck or a single cassette deck. I had a dual cassette deck and I would use, put the source material in the, uh, the left side and record on the right and I would just keep my finger on the pause button until the part that I wanted came up record pause and then lift up record lift push down stop so it was very linear editing and you'd got and I picked out the tape players I don't know how I figured this out but uh, at some some point I figured out that certain tape players <clears throat> were better built for that kind of work so you wouldn't get the squeaks and uh, there were some some of them had gaps i feel like there's one where it would like sense your finger and and do some kind of internal thing but you know what it's I'm a saying? wow like and a, flutter it stops the wow and flutter is what the term i want to say solenoid what's a solenoid uh so there, i remember there was this thing i don't know uh, necessarily the solenoid being the the thing but i remember there there was this especially when you're you're pausing there was this little uh, cap stand or whatever that would come up and would push on the tape just to help secure it so it wouldn't slide past. Like the the one that I the dual cassette deck that I had uh, had a spring loaded yeah. pause button, and it it do, it used not just that that quiet spring, uh, but it also had that thing that would keep it from you know when you stop it, it would stop it quickly and not like a slow stop. And then when you released right. it, it wouldn't like, you know, uh, like quickly take off. It would like resume at the same speed. And that's part of the, the mechanism mm-hmm. that, that they, some of the higher end decks would, would have, uh, or at least some of the later models. Yeah. It wasn't necessarily higher end. I don't know if it was necessarily a higher end tape deck that I had, but maybe. And what I just learned that this particular pause button, uh, mechanism was better than others. And, um, Particular back in high school, I, I I made so many pause edits that I popped that pause button right off of there, broke it off. Obviously not intentionally. I just wore it out. Well, how many did you end up buying? Well, I I ended up I I, I learned from my father to get the the no lemons guarantee from Best Buy when you buy <laughs> anything from them and. I was like, all right, seems like a waste of money, but it turned out to be worth it because they ended up replacing that pause button for me for free uh, three times. That's 
because they would fix it. I'd go home, make more tapes for months or weeks, and then that pause button would eventually pop right off again. Not because it was poorly made again, but because I was way abusing it. <laughs> and then I would bring it back in, and they'd be like, what are you doing with this thing? And I'd be like, I just make mixtapes. Just pressing the pause uh, button. Which wasn't exactly true. Yeah. So, yeah, I went through a lot of pause buttons. Let's just put it well, that way. Well, if there's any of the Geek Squad watching, uh, please don't think that all <laughs> your customers are doing what uh, John Nelson here has done. Not nowadays. I'd be, nobody's doing that right. now. When would that have been? That would have been 30 years yeah. ago. I wonder when Best Buy started because that's – it was a new store. Wow. So, again, so 92, and this is – this is uh, when did you graduate high school? 92. 92. 92. So 92, you, you made this tape. It was a sequential. It was layered. It had a theme and an arc, and, and it, more importantly, had Don Later. Joyce's transformative effect uh, – that you know you've you've taken something and turned it into your own. Uh, you yeah. then, and this is before you knew who Don Joyce was. When when did you first uh, find out about Negative Land? Um, it would have been probably two years later. Uh, living with she was my ex girlfriend and her roommate, a couple of uh, punks in Minneapolis, and. Uh, I was, I had, my bedroom was the walk-in closet, I remember. But anyway, he had gotten a tape from a friend of his, and he had never even heard it himself. He was just playing it for the first time, and I was floored, you know, because that was exactly what I had been looking for, that kind of mu music. Um, what tape was it? For at least five years, Guns, Negative Land's Guns, which I think they just put out because they needed to fill the gap left by their U2 release, which had been just sued out of existence. Not really, but... Right. Sued into existence. And, well, they definitely got more attention well, that, than they would have had, uh, you know... Uh, and you know you know the, the, the full story behind that, that it was uh, R.E.M.'s manager that called, uh, called Island Records on them, right? There's a really great uh, video of Mark Hosler uh, online talking to uh, some college class, telling the story about how he finally figured out who it was that alerted, you know, U2's manager and Island Records, and it was the manager of REM was in a record store and saw saw the record because it says you know U2 in large letters and then Negative Land in the smaller letters and he calls up uh, Island Records or specifically I think U2's manager because I think they were friends and says hey your boys have a new album out and they were like nope and he was like okay then so partly <laughs> there's a uh, REM is to blame <laughs> or at least their manager <laughs> No, you probably thought he was doing the right thing, but boy, that's just yeah. that's too bad. For those of you uh, who don't know the full story, uh, I can't stress enough how great the book uh, Fair Use, the uh, story of the letter U and the numeral 2, the Negative Land story, is. It's a, a really great book that tells uh, the entire story, or most of the story at least. Oh, Yo, I'm sure you have a copy. Probably signed as well, correct? No, I regret that. That's one of my regrets over the years. I, I met a lot of my heroes, and I never even, I never once thought to have anybody sign anything. <laughs> I was about to say uh, the the other night when we had our our uh, initial prep conversation, you showed me quite an impressive array of uh, things of of uh, collectible items that uh, I I too am searching for. So it's fantastic, and to know that you and we're going to get into the fact that you uh, have elevated your 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 own yourself uh with your work uh to to the heights of some of the, these people because like you you've walked amongst them you've you've talked to them you've you've booked them you've you've performed alongside of them i mean that's that's what most uh artists really want anyway is is a group acceptance and peers um uh you know being able to live and make money from it you know that's that would be great too uh, but uh, you've accomplished a lot more than uh, than a lot of a uh, lot of artists who who struggled to find acceptance, or at least even a, a small audience. Now that being said, when you first started to 
look into having an audience other than the 20 people that you gave a cassette to in a in high school uh when did you get into radio um <clears throat> i was well if you don't count the kids tape <laughs> uh, i was an art student and racking up a lot of debt with no plan no goal at all i mean zero I had no idea what I was going to do. And so when I decided to transfer to a different school in Chicago, also an art school, but kind of it's Columbia College there. They have an art program, but I wouldn't call them an art school. I was just afraid to continue on that path because, like I said, it was expensive. Art schools are just ridiculously expensive. I don't know about anyway. So I decided to choose a, a different major that might have a job attached to it when it was over. But also secretly, I, I planned, you know, that was probably the argument I gave my dad, who uh, was helping financially. He wasn't paying for it entirely, but he, he did help. And uh, But secretly, what I really wanted to do was, was hijack the production studios there for my own creative ends which is what i did i did all my assignments got good grades <laughs> but what i was really in there doing was making um i was pushing that those edits that i had been doing on tape prior using a four track and a reel to reel and the aforementioned wax pencils and razor blades and that was the first time that you actually made something that would wind up on an album later can you speak to that track it's one of my absolute favorites I had found that Mr. Rogers record, uh, which won't remember what it was called, had a mirror on the front. I forget what it was called, but it had a, it was, I think this, the track in question, he was actually reassuring children that, that they could not, they, you know, they didn't need to be worried about taking a bath. They were much too large to ever go down the drain. So don't worry about right. that. I, you know, and it, it's, it, it, it wasn't uh, rocket science to figure out that if you removed a word here or there, it actually ended up sounding like he was telling children, you know what? <laughs> You're just the right size to slide right down that drain. <laughs> and I just thought that was funny. And and then I, I think I just put that together as a joke for myself. But then once I had established that connection... And really what I'm doing right now is describing the process that most collage artists go through. Once I made that initial cut up just for my own pleasure or uh, amusement, I, as I listened to the rest of the record, I realized, oh, there's all kinds of other lines in this record that backs up that premise that children are small enough and lively enough to go down a bathroom <laughs> drain. And so I just started pulling all of those pieces out and setting them aside, so to speak, and played around with how they could go together. And you want to make it sound, I always did. Sometimes I think that might have been a bad idea to make it sound so smooth, you know, because sometimes like I'll play it for my wife or somebody and, and they'll be like, they're not aware of the hundreds of edits that are in there because they're all produced to sound like he's really just giving a speech on children being able to go down the drain. <laughs> But I put that together, and and for the first time, I got to put a track underneath it, too, which is really important. It was for me, anyway. Some of the stuff I've been working on lately, just for my own amusement, is more of the consecutive stuff, just a lot more, uh, just a lot more source material than I was using as a kid. But when I was in college using that four track, I got to put layers of sounds and sound effects underneath, and it was really... Yeah, it's it exciting everything you've been wanting That's not my to do. Track. Yeah, absolutely. And as I mentioned, when I stopped making cut-ups in 92, uh, it was because I was frustrated with the tools I had. So that's absolutely why I majored in radio at Columbia College, was to try and find these tools and see if I would be able to manage them. They're, they're, they're really challenging for me. I'm not a, a super techie, you know. And razor blades and wax pencils, that's that's just, that's just a lot more difficult than pause edits on a dual cassette. But the results are so much more exciting. So. Well, 
It was. Oh no, no, it's okay. I, I was going to try to 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 ask you uh, about uh, your your radio station again. That's Radio K. But what were the call letters? K U O M was my college. Do you radio remember station. the frequency? Seven seventy. Seven seventy. Oh, AM AM seven, radio. Mm-hmm. Yep. AM seven seventy Radio K in Minneapolis at the University of Minnesota. <clears throat> when that's actually why, when I ended up back in Minneapolis. Well, that's the reason I went back to Minneapolis, was to go to that school and volunteer at that radio station. Did you listen to that station previously back in high school? Mm-hmm. No, no, but in college. Oh. They didn't start until 93. I was actually, I heard them go on the air. I had actually, I had actually attended a, a meeting, a community meeting prior to them going on the air where they were looking for volunteers and I as shy as I am and was actually went up and asked about getting involved and and I wasn't a student I didn't realize it was college station so they they couldn't take me but a year later no 3 years later uh after a, a lot had happened <laughs> I found myself back in Minneapolis and was a student and got involved finally and so I was I- I think you just answered there. a question that I had, okay. uh, and that was: was it the you know the fact that you were making the you were seeking a larger audience for the the sounds you were creating that uh, that led you to get involved with radio, or was it just radio itself? It sounds to me like you know just the draw of radio. Period was something that that made you want to go to the station. At what point did you wind up choosing to create? your show, Some Assembly Required. Did you do a show before Some Assembly Required? No, I had DJed a couple of times, mainly because I think they wanted every volunteer to be able to do it. It wasn't like I had a driving... No, I wasn't. But you're right about the first part. I definitely was drawn to radio. I was very romantic about it. My scrapbook is full of bumper stickers for the modern rock radio stations that I just idolized i don't know if that's the word but i definitely was excited by every new modern rock radio station that tried and failed to be successful right now so you got involved with the station in 1996 is that correct Mm because there's another quote that i found from an interview about from you where it says i made a list of things to do which makes a lot of sense since you journaled a lot uh it said join the radio write a book put together enough sculpture to do a show and finish the CD. There's two things that we haven't talked about. Number one is the fact is that you're also sculpting at the time. Um, but uh, the question that I had is, did you ever finish the book? <laughs> I don't know. That's a, what interview was that? That's I was, that long... was probably from like 97 or 98. Oh man. Yeah. Really? Uh, I, I, yeah, someday. I have a lot of writing, and there are some things, but nothing, no, no. I was, I was just, I was really, uh, I was really flabbergasted by that, uh, because, you know, it said, it said in the interview, it says, two years later, the book remains unfinished, and I think the reason why that is, and it's still unfinished to this day, is that you have taken on a Herculean uh, amount uh, of tasks, um, and you've you've held so many uh, different uh, you know titles, if you will. Like you know, again, you're you're a sculptor, so you were putting on art shows. You had a radio show, so you were putting on shows for not just your own radio show, but for the local uh, film society. Um, you w- decided to start your own record label. Like you 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 kept doing all these things, plus putting out your own CDs and whatnot. And then the the and then networking that you you had to do in order to secure the guests that you wound up interviewing on your show. And as someone who does a, a weekly two hour show, there's a you know a lot of prep that goes into all of this. So I'm assuming that this yeah. this all took a lot of your time over a period of ten years. And mental energy, I can tell you, because. Unlike you, I really admire you. I mean, you're very outgoing. You know, I every time I reached out to somebody, it was painful because I'm just I'm not that kind of person. I'm but I'm much more of a recluse. You know, I don't want 
so I had to contact people. First of all, I had to contact people, so that was hard. Second of all, they were people I really looked up to and was afraid to talk to. And then I had to get on the phone with them and actually do it. And let me tell you, that does not come easily for me. Uh, that's why I only did about four a year. But that's you know. so much, so many, so many more interviews and so much more work <laughs> than most introverts would be able to do, especially introverts being a battling anxieties or anything else like that. It, it shows that you, even though you are battling all of you know these you know need this need to like stay in and not be outgoing or whatever else like that you have this tremendous drive what is there anything that that in, that pushed you like was there a voice in your head that said hey i know you're scared of like contacting steinsky or don joyce or john oswald or freelance hellraiser and and said no you have to do this um yeah i felt like and we talked about this before uh I felt like it, this was something that needed to be documented, and and I was not aware of it being documented, certainly not very thoroughly anywhere else, and I wanted to be the one to do it, I guess, you know. A, it needed to be done. I felt very strongly about that, and B, I wanted to be the one to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I definitely want to use this moment to say that one of the reasons why you are a guest on today's show is because you are a, a, a very large inspiration to to me. Uh, even though I am a social butterfly, it doesn't matter, uh, you know, as far as like taking on tasks like this or, or expending the energy or the time uh, or the mental capacity to, you know, the emotional capacity to take on something like this, uh, knowing that. You know, there is a limited audience. There's not a lot of not a lot of uh, reward other than, you know, history and our own personal gratification. Um, but your work, again, is so there's so many notes. Uh, there is so much detail and, and obvious care for this music and for the artists that you you work with um, that. I definitely want to be able to do the same thing with Masters of MASH and with some of the other projects that I, I wind up want to do that champion the work champion the work of my peers and of people that I'd and and people that are strangers that hopefully I will get to know. Um, including and th th I'll also mention something and this will this will go into the, the next thing we're gonna talk about. Um, talking to people who I've talked to online for twenty years but I've never seen right. face to face. And you are one of those people. I mean, except for in November, uh, I took my wife and I went to visit a friend in Portland. Um, and thankfully I found out that you lived there and we met up for the first time. And what was yeah. and the, the thing that ties us together is something that also features heavily within uh, a source of um, uh, mashups that were included within, you know, the early boom selection era and whatnot. And that is, is the uh, negative land fan base fan mailing group called snuggles. Uh, when did mm. you get involved with snuggles? How did you learn about that? Uh, it was when, um, it would have been just prior to getting involved at the radio station, uh, KUOM, I got on the internet and, that was the whole purpose of getting on the internet for me was to find, because I had been for the past, see, that was 95 that I got on the internet. So I'm fudging a little bit because in 95, I did not want to get on the internet. <laughs> the school I was going to made me. I, th I originally thought the internet, this would not be funny. I don't know if it pertains at all to what we're doing here, but it's funny Tell me. to me. I originally thought the internet <laughs> in 1995 was some major pain in the ass internal communication thing that the school was forcing me to do <laughs> and i was like oh come on just put a letter in my mailbox and i'll read it why do i have to get on here and like log into this computer screen i was not you know computers bleh. and uh but then one day i was checking my messages from the school which again I guess they were saving a tree, so that was good. And then all of a sudden, here's my dad in here. And I'm like, Dad, how are you on the school system? This is this is the internet, John. 
And I was like, I don't know what. <laughs> so no, I didn't originally, I wasn't originally excited about the internet, but slowly in, in fits and starts, I figured out what it was capable of. And then it became all about, oh, I can find out about all the records. I have to, you know, I, I'm sure they exist. They must, because I can't be the only one who's doing this, you know, because I, for years, was doing it myself, as we talked about at home, and bothering, and I mean, I would go into every record store I ever found and bother the clerks. Have you, can you think of any any bands or any records that take one source and layer it with another source, and then there's like hundreds of different tapes, and they're all talking to each other, and they would just look at me like there's a new Rolling Stones record, and I'd be like, that's not really what I'm looking for. <laughs> but then I got on the internet and found out, yes, long story short, there are a lot of those kinds of records. Not as many as, as I would have liked, but boy, there sure are now. And, and then, to finally address your question, uh, one of the groups that I joined to find that information was Snuggles. And I mainly just lurked there, because even online, I'm very shy. And, and I would just I guess, eavesdrop on what you and everybody else was talking about. And I discovered uh, Wiffle Fist and um, Dove Entertainment. That's probably where I heard about John Oswald. I, I knew about Negative Land, by the, obviously, by that point. So Negative Land really was sort of a, a point of entry because they were the only collage band I knew about at the time. And I was just on their website. They were one of the first people with a website, if I'm remembering correctly. I, don't, I hope I'm not uh, sharing false information there. But I believe they had a very, they were on the early web. And I was looking at their website, and it said they had a message board or something. Well, they Isn't had two. Was there was one that was, I think, the, 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 their news list, which was called Forklifters. And then there, oh, was, yeah. uh, then there was Snuggles, which is kind of like, you know, all of us... Uh, Want to be, uh, you know, sample adelic, you know, sample based artists uh, that were, you know, right. what what would now call, be called stands of Negative Land. Uh, What's a stand? What would, it's a it's an Eminem reference. Uh, number one to the song "Stan," meaning like an obsessive fan. Uh, it's currently oh. you'll be hearing it in on on CNN. You'll hear stands being used in regular news parlance now as a uh, heard, uh, as a yeah. term for obsessive fan. Man. I had heard that expert. I didn't know what it was. And I don't think I'm an ex obsessive fan, although I did send them a letter once. I have it in my scrapbook. No, I got. The, I have the response from Dear them in my Don. scrapbook. Dear <laughs> Don. I think it just said Dear Negative Land. I didn't know who the members were. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, I was. it was very exciting to discover Negative Land because, like I said, aside from, like, uh, Mars and The Art of Noise, of course, and, you know, sampling had started to come into pop music. I, did, I wasn't aware of anybody who was really doing it as thoroughly as they could, and Negative Land really so was. So that being said, that sounds to me like you were not aware of uh, Emergency Broadcast Network until way later. No. Okay. I think the evolution, Mark Gunderson Matter of fact, me to you that. probably knew, knew of Evolution Control Committee before you knew about EBN, yeah? Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, did you? Sure. W what did you experience first? Uh, and and this actually could be the same answer. Uh, would it be mashups, or would it be <clears throat> Evolution Control Committee? Evolution Control Committee by a mile. Yeah. Yeah. And so when you when you, you know, when you first heard Evolution Control Committee, did you hear the whip, whipped cream mixes and just not identify it as part of what that was? I think if I remember correctly, and it was a long time ago, 24 or 23 years ago, I think the program director at Radio K, and he was the guy who actually, he was one of the main people who founded the, the station, Jim Muscle, who we all really looked up to, and I, I really did anyway, and so I would follow him around, and, and he found, he, he showed me this record, I, he he showed me the whipped cream mixes just like he presented it to me as a novelty record which isn't an, an insult uh at all i don't think and he was like well you might like this it's got samples in it <clears throat> yeah although the, i think it was the previous version oh 
Or, right. or was you're it that they showed you rocked by rape? I don't remember. I don't remember. I'm pretty sure I hadn't seen. I think I saw the whipped cream mixes first, and uh, so I was aware of it, but I don't think I had played it yet. But then I went into Let It Be Records on Nicollet Avenue. It used to be on Nicollet Avenue in Minneapolis. It was a great record store. Quite a few good record stores in Minneapolis at the time. And, <clears throat> and one of the clerks there was one of the only clerks I ever talked to who knew what the heck I was talking about and showed me the uh, compact disc instructions uh, binder that they were selling as an album. And really what it was was more of an instruction book for how to what was it? Didn't, didn't you have to microwave so it's, CDs? It's, it's very similar that? to another thing that you showed me. A uh, matter of fact, can you grab that compact dist- destructions that I know that you have? Because I want you to show that picture of uh, of Mark Gunderson, trademark Gunderson. Here, here is a very young trademark Gunderson. Tilt it forward so you don't see the reflection. Well, there it is. Look at that. An actual picture pre pre hair dye of uh, trademark Gunderson, and show the bottom where you can see uh, what it says on the the package for the title. It's com- he would have you believe that was his brother. I think didn't he didn't he used to talk about having a twin brother? <laughs> right, maybe the maybe this is the that twin sounds- brother. Who knows? Um, I think that's now that being said, the that is uh is similar in concept to another uh, piece of uh, art that you have, which is uh, Christian Markley's uh, record without a cover, which oddly you keep in a cover to... Oh, no, you're not supposed to tell me that. <laughs> I'm embarrassed by that. I don't mean to be snitching on you, I'm sorry. The only thing that he... I don't mean sorry. to be snitching on you, I'm sorry. Uh, one, of the, one of the instructions when you get that album is never put it in a cover, because the whole point as you could probably explain better, is that it's supposed to get worn up and scratched up. and Yeah, it's, it's the, it's the act of not having the cover that creates all the pops and hic- uh, clicks and right. the hiss and whatnot. Therefore, putting the program on the blank grooves of the record over time, therefore, you know, each record would then be unique in its, its sound. And with Compact Destruc- Destructions, you know, he's taking an imper- a... a at the time touted perfect, you know, skipless format, you know, perfect digital, whatever, and showing that, you know, with there are specific techniques that you can use to do the same thing that you would do with that record, which is scratch it, you know, warp it or like melt it or do whatever you have to do and then stick it into a, at the time, CD player that didn't have error correction and it would just go crazy and skip and make stutters and... All kinds of stuff. Well, the the technique I found, and I was in a a really fortunate position when I had that binder in that I worked at the college radio station, and the music director had a stack of CDs that he didn't want, didn't like. I don't know what he was going to do with them. They wouldn't, you couldn't have sold them to a, you know how it is when you work at a radio station, you get thousands of CDs. Yes. So I was like, "Do you have any CDs that you just that you really literally don't need?" And there's, uh, it hurts to even say it, that there's no value to. And he gave them to me. And so what I did was, I practiced pretty extensively with the microwave down in the office at the station, putting CDs in the microwave. And you had to, you know yeah. what I'm talking about, right? Okay. And you put it on like a low setting or something. And you watched through the window, and the very second you saw a little crack of lightning go from one side to the other and make contact, boom, open the door immediately, because if you leave it in there too long, it'll just fry it to the point. And I mean like a millisecond. So the minute you see that lightning arc, just boom. And what it would do is it would just make it skip, but in a really pleasant, for, you know, for guys like us anyway, pleasant way. And I, I would take those recordings and loop them and and push them further, and that was Mark. I never would have, I never would have come up with that on my own. That's for sure. Well, I mean, just like the music we're, we're, that we're talking about, uh, which is you know collage or, or even with mashups, it's 
literally taking things that and ideas that existed previously and combining them to make a whole new thing. And you and I got a little deep in, into existentialism in our conversation the, the night before. And, and really, I think it, you, we, we came to a consensus that, I mean, who we are as people are, are, are an amalgam of everyone and everything we've ever experienced. You know, our parents, our friends, mm -hmm. That, you know, the culture that surrounds us, it, it all becomes, you know, we, we pick and we choose, but at the same time, even the things that we don't pick and choose, like good example, like I'm fine with, you know, All Star by Smash Mouth now because of the number of times it's been, you know, completely rearranged. Um, and, but initially when it first came out, I was just like, I'm not, I'm not having this. And like, you know, even the things that, you know, no matter what its format things have have an effect on you and change the way that you interact with the world and, and create you as a person so it, mm -hmm. it is all intertwined with you know when you say it, it was mark's idea and not yours I, i'm sure that we could find somebody you know before him like john cage who you know would or christian markley actually would be a better example who it would just des destroy things to create more right. different sounds <coughs> so but I don't think anybody else had the idea of putting it in a microwave. So let's go ahead and give Gunter some credit for that. That's pretty uh, well, Again, again, different tools and, and a different time period. Same same aesthetic, same ideas. It's just uh, tools enable us to do things. And, and that's a great segue uh, from your show, which primarily at the time uh, focused on turntablists, sound collagists, and, uh, and, and what? I, I guess reel-to-reel uh, -reel, you know, enthusiasts. Uh, who or cassette cassette enthusiasts, tape enthusiasts, I should say, uh, who were making these sound collages uh, with the existing works mm -hmm. that were around them, and acknowledging that in the late '90s, when Napster showed up and gave everyone the access to, you know, the world's music, to everybody's you know personal CD library, where where if if anybody who was from that time remembers. Like you had to go to a physical store. You had to buy a, a CD that was wrapped in plastic wrap and take it home and unwrap it. Every once in a while, you'd find a record store that would turn around and have a program where they would let you unwrap it, take it to a listening station, and then they would rewrap it. That was very short lived. Uh, pretty much anything oh that was like a. Uh, a B-side put out in the UK or in another country was a uh, an album that you had to buy, or like even a single was like forty dollars. So it was really hard to Sometimes, get a hold yeah. of music, it, and it was the industry trying to force people to buy entire albums based off the strength of whatever one single that you'd hear on the radio. And so here comes Napster, which opens the floodgates, allows people to you know have explore music that they couldn't otherwise uh, afford. Uh, it was it was a great dem uh, it, it's it, how do I say it De democracy democratic uh, democratizing I guess it, it really just opened mm -hmm. it up for everybody and so not only do you have this at this exact same time period but you have things like acid or you have things like a, a program that you used called tape two or what was it called deck two deck, deck two. two bias, bias. right and, and so you have the ability to edit. Like without renting a huge studio or without having to buy super expensive equipment other than maybe the computer that you already have. And so you have all these mm -hmm. tools, you have all of this, and it all comes together in this amazing way. I mean, you can – I'm sure even before we get into mashups, did you see that – did you see the, that tool, those two tools, like Napster and like file sharing and digital audio workstations? Did you see the change in the music, the sound collage music, and the kind of uh, themes and things that were the the dense structures or anything? As a result, as a result, as a result of you know people having the ability to digitally edit at home, as well as having access to more sound samples. To be honest with you, I think Napster was coming out and going strong around the same time I was discovering most of the collage artists. Like 96, 97. So I can't speak to how Napster affected it because to me it was all new at that time. But I can tell you, it just makes sense. I mean, obviously, as the tools became more user-friendly... 
the floodgates opened, you know. Uh, so yeah, in the years following Napster, yeah, definitely I could see that happening in the immediate aftermath. But at the time, though, I wouldn't have been able to notice. Yeah, yeah. no, no. I'm, I was specifically trying to say because you did the show for twelve years, you know, you you can uh, see, yeah. you can look at this as the locus point. And then see, you know, boom, the floodgates opened up. I'll tell you this. When I first played mashups, it was very clear, even from listening. Because, I mean, you had to go through hundreds to find a dozen that were really, really good. You yeah. know what I mean? I mean, and, and so it was clear by listening. You learned by listening to the, the shaky ones that... This is not easy to do. It's really hard. And the people who, especially back then, and the people who were making it work, it was just like, wow, you're amazing. You know, and not that it's gotten so easy now that it's easy to make a good one. But I can tell you, over the 12 years I did the show, and then having taken nearly 10 years off, and tuning back in. And I honestly don't think I've downloaded more than three mashups in the past 10 years, uh, which is crazy. I know, but I, I have just been so busy with my family and lots of moving. You, and you other took things. the, you, you basically, uh, and I'm going to make this joke here. I know because I was thinking about it in the shower this morning is that you were so prolific and you basically pulled a, um, a Rick Moranis on us. <laughs> if, if for those of you who don't know, Rick Moranis, the comedian, you know, gave up his oh, career sure. to yeah. create his family and spend time with his family. That's essentially true. That's essentially true. Yeah, I I burned out is what happened. I really burned out. I was just like you said, I was doing too much and also working a job because you know it wasn't paying the bills. So when I when when the baby came along, it was like you know what, <laughs> this might be the perfect time. And I did. I just stopped doing everything. And that was that was around 2011, 2010. 2010. Yeah. So let's let's right. bridge this gap over the next uh, 40 minutes. Or sorry. Oh, look at that! I wanted to show you. That's why. That's what I've been busy with. Can yes. you see it? That's me and my boy. What's your boy's name? Henry. When he was just a a baby. I made teeny tiny pictures and put them in these dollhouse frames. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah. So that's what I was doing immediately following. Uh, I used to call it a retirement, but I got a lot of groans from people when I said that. <laughs> but I just quit, you know, focused on You'll find on that uh, there's a lot of people, especially within the mashup community, that you love to use that word retirement. Like, oh, I've retired. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. And a, like a lot of people who have retired, a lot of those same people have come out of retirement. Uh, if you remember, even notably, even notably, uh, at the time when the record industry was trying to co-opt mashups, uh, remember that Jay-Z himself, around the same time he did the Linkin Park album, was, I'm retired. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to retire. And, and that's oh, going to be, they? oh yeah, it was a huge, huge stunt, a huge ploy. And uh, then, of course, you know, he, he comes back or whatnot. So this being said, uh, as your child grows and you wind up having more time to yourself, uh, is there any plans to uh, pick back up uh, any of your work, whether it be music or, you know, uh, a show or maybe finish that book? I am. I have been taking the, the writing a lot more seriously lately. But it's it's so personal. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. That's the problem. Too shy to share. But I am actually, and this is, you did not know about this. I we didn't talk about this, but I have over the years found some people who who have asked me to do another show. And recently, I've been talking to some some people. I don't know if I really want to announce it yet because it, this I'm is not, not sure an announcement, gonna... folks. We're just talking, <laughs> just talking. But I have been thinking about about doing radio again because I do have a little more free time now that I'm not constantly carrying around a a little bundle. And he, you know, is becoming his own person now. He's almost ten, 
And uh, yeah, I've, I've thought about it, and I very likely will at some point. Would that be in conjunction if if you had your choice? Would that be in conjunction with an actual physical radio station, or would that be maybe something like this on Twitch, or like some kind of a visual component, or would it specifically be like podcast? What form would it take? It would be on a a a, a radio station, radio, mm -hmm. or or at least their internet stream, let's say. And then I would use that recording and, and add it to my old podcast and continue the the series there. Because well. there's the thing is is uh, it's it's amazing. And one of the things that I'm enjoying about doing this show is that all the work that you did was ten years ago. Um, and it not only is it prime you know, nostalgia time for mashups and some of the early you know sound collage work of you know twenty from our youth when we were in our twenties. Um, but, uh, it, um, a lot has changed is what I was trying to say. A lot, a lot has changed with the attitudes, with the, the feels, you know, people have either gone into retirement or unfortunately passed away, or, you know, we've seen how, uh, our music back then uh, and the music of the, that we enjoyed has, uh, been reflected in current culture or has gone on to, you know, receive accolades, um, so yeah, I, I love updating this from this angle. I would love to see your show, uh, revisit some of these same themes. Um, and terrestrial radio is great. And that also brings up the fact is that at, at one point with your show, uh, you, uh, became nationally syndicated, uh, up on upwards of 60 stations across the United States, correct? Yep. Around 2004, I think. Yeah. You you yeah. were you were very good uh, and you did have some help um, with you know getting some of that done because yeah. uh, and and this being said uh, for everyone out there who is an artist or who is an organizer or who who wants to get a message out you, remember a lot of this a lot of the work does rest on your shoulders but a lot of the great gains can't be done without a team to a certain extent you do need to have people that you are able to network with you're able to you know come together with and really uh really achieve these goals and your show very specifically uh lent a hand to a lot of these artists like i'm reading just when we talk about mashups like you you had two you had three things first of all can we talk about the structure of your show how did the structure of some mm -hmm. assembly required work like the average show <clears throat> you're talking about the types of music I well i mean so i'm trying to get at is that you you had live interviews occasionally um you uh, -huh. uh did a sh your show was mainly playing music from the different angles of sound collage uh whether that be yeah. on a turntable or tape or mashups or, or sound collage proper artist with a capital a kind of thing um but you also uh, sent out what's basically a a Q and A form to people that you admired to see if they would respond to you and to uh, you know highlight them on your blog, and and it, sometimes that would wind up you know going into an interview. I'm assuming, but I'm looking at this list, and so I'm I'm just going to read out some of the people that you did cover <laughs> from the mashup scene from the you know the 2010s, uh, and because you have it alphabetically, this is going to be alphabetical. Uh, a and D, uh, you know, Deidre, Deidre and uh, Adriana uh, were were there, um, you know, talking about booty, um, uh, booty mashup now, by the way. Uh, Agro One, DJBC, Colatron, Copycat, Divide and Create, Desico, or is it Desico? Which one was it? I always pronounce it Desico. Okay. I've remember. heard both Desico and Desico. Hope maybe, hopefully, yeah. I'll have him on the show at some point. Uh, DJ Early Bird, Earworm, Evolution Control Committee, DJ EZG, uh, who was uh, somebody who was on that Best Bootlegs in the World Ever CD, uh, Freelance Hellraiser, French Bloke, Futuro, Girl Talk, Go Home Productions, IDC, The Kleptones, Linlo, Lobster Dust, Aussie Miso. Party Ben, Fat Bastard, RIAA, DJ Rico, Soundhog, Sark Effect, Team Nine, Voice Dude, Wax Audio, The Who Boys, and DJ Zebra. I mean, wow. I remember <laughs> uh, during this time period, some of these people, 
I mean, I obliquely had access to through, you know, being on Gaibo, uh, being uh, on Snuggles, uh, and never, never, I guess, I guess I didn't have the, I mean, I definitely had radio shows at my college radio station that, you know, I would play some of the stuff. Uh, we were also busy trying to do our own thing that you, you did on some of your early programs, which was your second hour was to do what, like a, a live improv Yep. Live improvised. Right. Collage. So it's so it's like so, I, I was doing the same things, but you took it so much further and you reached out to all of these people and really just took basically a, a snapshot of the time period. And again, can you give the web address one more time? Line? Yeah, for Line? where they can read these interviews. Oh. Oh. Uh, it's some dash assembly dash required dot net. And I don't know the so you'd have, if you scroll down a little bit on that page, you'll see a yellow banner that says interviews. Yeah, and you'll be able to see all of these uh, early mashup artists and interviews, as well as some of the top, uh, you know, uh, sound collages that uh, collagists at the time, um, including people who went on to do uh, things like there's members of the break core scene in there. Like you were you were talking about how. Uh, What's the guy that was really rude, or that you you thought came off as rude? I, I read it, and I think it's a little bit of self deprecation. Uh, what's his name? Uh, not stuntman Mike or punk rock Mike. What was the guy's name? I don't remember. Okay. A- anyway, you pointed out that we did. Uh, oh, are you talking yeah, about yeah stunt, stunt rock? rock? So like you know his interview, like he he's like you know I hate my life and blah 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 and pretentious art people and yada 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 and he, he, he just goes off and i really think that a lot of that is a a ploy and b especially when you look at break core <coughs> that th- there's a lot of like punk rock posturing in that uh, that scene there's a lot of like a uh, disregard for what's noted as authority uh, again just punk rock themes uh, so I think that he was completely playing in. As a matter of fact, some of the people that were in the the comments are basically turning around and saying like, "Yeah, I love this guy. He's so right on." Like, yeah, that's that's exactly in, in response to him like saying, really, really self deprecating. Like, you know, I I wish I'd, I'd rather kill myself than do this interview kind of stuff. Um, yeah, uh, I couldn't. Yeah, <laughs> I I did warn. I worried about him a little bit. Oh, he's you fine. Know, I'm sure. I'm sure he is 100 percent fine. Uh, but. So of this this group that I wound up just listing, uh, your first uh, interview uh, for a mashup artist was I was the freelance. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I guess I guess Mark Gunderson, but you were probably more you know asking him oh. about his sound collage, not focused on mashups. But oh. when you focused on mashups, right. your your interview and and again you can you can listen to all of these interviews streaming live on his website as well. Uh, with uh, Freelance Hellraiser was really eye-opening because I, I wound up you know, revisiting it last night. And uh, oh, you it, it's... So there's there's a joke that goes on in the mashup scene and that started, uh, at least at least for most of us, started the moment that mashups were created, which is that mashups are dead. You know, uh, oh, it, you know, it's been done. It's, not- it's played out. It's it's all this giant joke, and so you have freelance Hellraiser on your program via the phone, and he's saying that when pre boom selection, that they're making mashups and they're passing it around to friends and it, and it played around in a couple of clubs in their in their area, and he's saying right then before anything even takes out before he does stroke of genius even. He's saying, yeah, we figured it was pretty much dead. We figured it, you know, it was just a flash in the pan and it was just, you know, nothing and whatever else like that. And the entire interview, and again, this interview is in what year? It was like 2000. I've got the notes here somewhere. Uh, 2006. So you're interviewing him in 2006. And he's still adamant, like the entire interview goes of just like, you know, yeah, this entire thing is so played out and it's, it's all over. And like, you know, the moment that people started making mashups to make mashups that, you know, mashups are over. And, and I find it so delicious that, you know, that there are still millions of people that appreciate mashups and still people uh, making mashups and that uh, booty mashup is still going strong despite COVID trying to destroy the world. Um, it, it's, it's, it's inspiring to see 
it's that old saying, what is it? Uh, the queen is dead, L- long, long live the queen. So you're saying he was joking? No, no, that? he wasn't joking at all. Oh, yeah. Like, you can listen to that interview, and he is like, he's just kind of deriding. And it, it's a little bit of that self-deprecation that you get out of out of stunt rock. <clears throat> I sometimes have a, have trouble reading <laughs> the room. and uh, So for all I knew, he was joking. I took him at his word. Uh, but yeah, no, I didn't think it was dead at the time. In fact, I was just, I had been aware of it. You said 2006? Yeah for at least five years and for me it had just been getting more and more interesting every year so when he said that i i would have met if i I don't remember to be honest i don't remember what my response was but i can imagine it was nah (laughs) it's not over at all it's just getting started you know in 2006 2006 is uh, when that was but my question is um what year (laughs) I'm trying to remember what year that came out. Uh, I guess that would have been 2004. DJ Foods rating the 20th century. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. I remember that. Came out uh, in like around 2004, and you interviewed him in 2005, but way before or a year before Freelance Hellraiser. And I know the, for a fact that there were quite a number of uh, of people uh, who. We yeah, mashup. were, were yep. mashup people, including um, it was Thrift Shop XL that had two uh, mashups. Or wait, it was Instamatic that had two mashups on rating the, the 20th century, I do believe. Um, previous guest. Um, now, that being said, you said that, you know, mashups slowly filtered into your show, uh, pre- mainly because of the uh, best bootlegs in the world ever. And uh, there was, uh, there was, this even comes up in the Freelance Hellraiser interview that there was a misprint on that CD. That the Smells Like Teen Booty was uh, misattributed. Do you remember that? Was that what it was because, called? Because, yeah, it was, it was, was it Smells Like, uh, I could have sworn it was Smells Like Teen Booty. I feel like there was. I well, can't some, somebody will correct yeah, us in the chat here very shortly. Uh, here on the uh, the live version for Twitch, uh, but that being said, um, it was originally attributed to Freelance Hellraiser because you asked him about it in in the interview, and he's like, "Yeah, he's like, I always thought that too many DJs was going to get mad at me, thinking that I had perpetuated that, but you know, it's it's definitely not me. Maybe I should have made some sort of a an announcement." That is actually, you know, too many DJs who made that that mashup. Um, yeah, what I remember what he told me was that at the time he was one of the better known mashups for good reason. He's really talented, and so a lot of times if people didn't know who had made it, they would just put Freelance Hellraiser on there. Isn't that? Did he say that, or did I end up cutting that part out? <laughs> so that's how he gets attributed. That's how he gets credited with some mashups that aren't his. It's not not he didn't choose to do that. Obviously, it's just people going. Well, I don't know who did this. Must have been yeah. Freelance and, and um, I was wrong. It's it smells <laughs> like booty was the name of it. So by by too many DJs. Yeah, that's uh, matter of fact. You, you said that at the time it was that was your favorite mashup. Sure, at the time, and it's definitely still. And you know that's a great mashup. You know, it's one of those rare mashups that a sounds good when you put those two songs together. Uh, B, the, there's such wildly different genres that your brain is going, <laughs> ah! and C, the the tone or the subject matter actually kind of works together a little bit. It's that perfect mix, you know, and that rarely happens. So, and did he? No, no, go oh, ahead. You you finish that thought, please. I can't remember what we talked about in that interview or what I ended up including because I often. I would often talk to my interviews, interview subjects just like you are for like two hours, but then I would only get to play 20 or 30 minutes of the, so who knows what I included and didn't, but I remember asking him how hard it was to make that magic happen, where all three of those things happen, where the beats match up, it doesn't, it's not out of tune, it's also kind of wild, and there's, it it works on a story level or a tone. And he said, uh, I said, how, how, what is it that, how do all those things combine? And he said, it's a fucking coincidence. 
<laughs> he, you know, he wasn't, of course, I couldn't play that because we were on the radio. I had to beep it out if I did. But, you know, at least at that point, he, he, he wasn't trying to make that happen. It just sort of happens sometimes. So, but those are my favorite mashups when all of those things line up. When you when you talk about having uh, or having had longer conversations, do you still have those uh, those archives of the interviews? I do. I do. So maybe this is something. Yeah. Can I? Can I? If you do wind up doing another show, can I uh, make a request that you remind some of those interviews to, you know, mm. share some some insights that might not have been shared on the show previously? I actually, when Don Joyce passed away, I dug around and found, that's how I know I have all these. And I found the conversation I did with him. And I've talked to the band uh, about putting that up just out of respect for him. Because uh, My question is, Don is here with me today. Is Don here with you today? <laughs> no, I never got okay. that. I never got one yeah, of those. Yeah, this is, this is two... Two grams, yeah, two grams of the actual human remains of, of Don S. Joyce that they, they uh, put out along with, I also wind up getting the, uh, the, one of their carts. <clears throat> yeah, I really wanted one of those. Oh, and yours says fear and anxiety. That would have been, I should have gotten that one. <laughs> yeah, oh, no, fear and anxiety is crossed out. And then it says, tonight. No fear and anxiety well, tonight. The thing is, I really That's... wish... Do you have an active cart machine? No. I do have some carts, though. I used to record <laughs> my uh, sound collages on them. I brought that down to show you the Yeah, I've, I've probably got three carts in general here in my uh, my stash. I'm, I'm at some point need to find a cart machine because, you know, just like any archivist, you have to have the, the machine to play your format on. Uh I need a mini disc player because that's what Dude, I. Dude, I've using. got so many mini disc players that like so some still work and some don't. And uh, I, you know, uh, the track. By the way, when we talk about like uh, you, your involvement in Snuggles and you talking about being a lurker, uh, you didn't lurk for long because you know <clears throat> you wound up contributing to the Droplift project. You wound up, and you probably through Remori wound up uh, doing the E Toy uh, compilation. And then uh, you mm -hmm. wind up on Free Speech for Sale, which uh, I had also done a track. The, my, uh, my, the track that I did uh, called Pick Up the Phone was completely recorded mm -hmm. off of the television uh, onto Minidisc and then edited on Minidisc. And, and if you remember oh, yeah. having how you do splices and you could rearrange the things, yeah. that took me a long time. And I about broke one of the, the little handheld machine that I had doing it. We had uh, at the station... Uh, the in big industrial yeah. ones, you know, and those, I use those as samplers. I never used a sampler when we performed uh, that second hour, but I would use those things, those big, you know, play pause. Right. Yeah. I assume that's what samplers do. I don't know. I've never used so one. So let's talk real quick about mashups um, as far as a genre descriptor and also as its, its role in... In, in your life or, or your, your evolving attitudes towards towards the genre because when you when you first uh, you and I were talking about how like you know again <clears throat> here you are entrenched you're, you're putting on festivals uh, for uh, appropriated art you're you're doing uh, film based stuff and like serious capital a artist stuff um, and you you say that you know you you heard, the deliciousness of mashups, uh, but it, a part of it kind of like made you, you know, in, initially angry. Like, it's just like, ah, oh, what is this? And not angry in an offended way, but just angry. I don't know. Maybe I wouldn't have, maybe I wouldn't have said anger, but just irritated. I think that's a better word <laughs> because at first, you know, it's just like you, your eyes it has to make sense of all the light that's entering and with these mashups, at first you have to hear it and make sense of it. And at first it does sound like noise. It really does. The first time I played it, I was like, somebody's just laid these two songs on top of each other. And you have to get over your prejudice against one of the genres, usually, because maybe you're not a big pop music fan. And uh, But then, if you can open your mind, and most people can... Uh, you realize, no, these, these, okay, this works. 
you know. But at first, it's a little irritating. And I and I told you the story of how when I first got that best bootlegs in the world ever, which is not within reach, I just put it on my studio stereo and was listening to. That's how I reviewed records at the time. I would just put them on and walk around doing my own thing. And there was a guy on the other side of the wall, a friend of mine who had the studio next door, and he came in. We were friendly like that, and he comes in and he goes, "What?" in the what is this you know he was definitely irritated and i was just one step beyond that where i was like well i hear where you're coming from but just listen for a second and i think i queued up the one i thought was especially good and played it for him and he was able to see it you know sort of begrudgingly he wasn't a big fan of my show <laughs> in general but we were good friends and uh, but yeah, it, it it is irritating at first until you until your brain is able to f- figure out what's happening and how it's working and it and it really does work a lot of time. A lot of the time it does. Let's see if I uh, do you still have that uh, quote? Because here here's the thing is uh well first of all I, I take that back you, you, because of your initial kind of like focus and because of your warming up to this format you didn't focus a lot on mashups initially and you know just throwing in one at a time but you said over time that uh it wound up being almost at least for a show if not more um and again you started to interview people like girl talk and go home productions uh what would you call like kid 606 and girl that would talk be more like glitch glitch yeah so to go even more in depth, although we're running out of time, I guess, um, when I first started the show, what I really wanted it to be was all the artists I played were like the sound clocks that I made, which which is a hundred percent sampled mm-hmm. material. So I was now I was going to include only the artists I found that were one hundred percent, which would never. I, there's not enough artists to do that. So I had to open my mind right away. And the first thing I did was say, well, okay, it doesn't have to be 100%. Maybe it has to be 50%. And so, you know, from there, I I expanded further to uh, hip-hop DJs, like turntablists and and the like, because that's at least 50%. That's actually probably 100% sampled. And from there to glitch. And the last thing I really had to uh, open my mind to was mashups. And I think that's where you're going with this. And, and I was, I waited too long. I wish I had played them immediately because then I'd have extra bragging rights. But uh, I think, what did we say? By, by, by 2000, 2005, I, some, I would say 2004, you really started like making it just a regular part of the show. Yeah, but I had played them as early as 2001. Mm-hmm. Yep. Right? And then 2002 is when they started. But anyway, yeah, no, I mean, look, we're that. not here to establish your indie cred. You know, you're not, you're not the, the <laughs> you're not, you're not recounting an LCD sound system song. You're, you're literally, it's their song called "Losing My Edge." It's like I was there when blah 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 happened. You know, uh, this isn't, this isn't the point. the The point is, is that you know, I want to highlight that you know. So it takes some people some time and that's another reason why. And also uh, it takes some time for it to spread. Like well, your interview with, um, with, uh, Mark, oh, with, sorry, with Mark Vidler, AKA go home productions. He specifically talks about how, uh, you know, MTV and you in the UK was, uh, you know, asking him to do video mixes and stuff like that early on and that you know that record labels were reaching out to him but that due to legal reasons and whatever else like that it never picked up in the united states and that's despite and he talks at length about despite the work that adriana and deidre were doing at the time with booty um Mm -hmm. really championing championing it and he's like you know you saw a little bit of it but uh but it never really took off and so because of that it's like it still is kind of new to a lot of the people here in the United States. And as much as we are know about mashups for, for 20 years, the reason why you see, you know, some of the, the newer people within mashup, uh, you know, DJ Cumberbun or, uh, uh, again, uh, just, or any, any YouTube, you know, mashup artist these days, um, are getting all these new people, not only because of the, the, the old saying, um, it's like an old NBC slogan. If you haven't seen it, it's new to you. 
uh, along with the uh, right. the uh, who was the the circus the the very famous circus for the animal not the animal crackers the the most famous circus animal circus. Barnum and Bailey. So Barnum and Bailey has there was a sucker born every minute, and it's talking about the gullibility <laughs> of people. And it's it's really the fact is that you know look, not everybody has had the the exposure that that they need to have to be cultured, uh, cultured, um, which <laughs> is a whole other argument by in itself. But there's always this new audience plus an underserved audience, and so mashups, uh, especially since seeing as that mashup is le- almost less a genre and more of a technique. Um, but is both, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it, 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 I don't, I don't see it ever really dying, uh, cause it's really just talking about sound collage, but very specifically within like pop music and genre clash and, you know, but specifically within that radio friendly format and even, and, and even joke stuff. Cause so again, it's like, that's another thing about this show and I'm sorry to ramble on here, but literally it's, it, Another thing, another reason why I have this show is I want to talk to the people who were involved uh, at these early stages, 15 and 20 years ago, um, to really have these conversations about uh, all the subgenres that exist within the genre of mashup. The uh, really talk about what distinguishes sound collage from mashups. You know, because I mean, I know mm-hmm. even listening to some of your interviews, like when you were on NPR's uh, On Point with Tom Ashbrook in 2009, uh, you know, they, they start the show with a girl talk track and are like, you know, wow, this is exciting. You know, you've got twisted sister over the top of blah, blah, blah. John, can you, can you talk to the the artists that are being used right here? And you're like, no, I'm not, not a real pop (laughs) person. And I'm, I'm here to talk about sound collage. And he's like, all right then, you know, and then just continues to talk about mashups. Uh, it's, it, but that's that's the thing is that even within that, Tom Ashbrook himself is uh, talking about your music as mashups. And we've even heard Trademark Gunderson on this show talk about, oh, good, finally there's a there's a descriptor that says that that covers, you know, sound collage and mashups. And I, I would say that while it's kind of like what's what's the science terms in biology? It's like phylum and like family or what's the the structure? You know what I'm talking about when you're classifying animals, no. animal cla- classifications. <laughs> it's like there's okay. there's the broader families, or it's sort of, sort of like you say there's rock, there's hair metal, there's you know industrial rock, there's all the you know all these different <laughs> formats here. It's like mashup seems to be this top descriptor, and are we doing are we doing I, I don't know. Again, this is a whole other show that I need to have where we do nothing but talk about what are mashups how do we really mm-hmm. distinguish you know what because uh, when we as it even factors into like what's a good mashup or not like people turn around and say well i had to filter through 100 mashups before i found four good ones and that's four good ones to that person you know what i'm saying there, yeah. there's a lot of people that don't like crumple bangers there's a lot of people that don't like you know overtly pop dance floor ready mashups they see it as too commercial um, so mm-hmm. those four mashups are going to be different depending on who's really picking that. Um, so again, do you okay, have so that quote that you sent me, um, the other day from the phone caller from that, uh, uh, on point, um, uh, let me see if I can find it. Was it in a text or an email? Uh, it was in an email. Oh, oh. And uh, it really talked to something that it, it talked to kind of like something that you said at the end of that interview with him, where you said, where well, he said, how he asked you wh- where you wanted to see mashups going as far as like a genre or a term. And you said, I'd like to see all these different subgenres becoming less and less defined. Uh, but specifically, you said that I think in the context of uh, you want to see more densely layered stuff, you want to see. Uh, more mirror, more of it mirroring the melting pot of uh, our society, which again, uh, this this young lady who uh, called in spoke to very eloquently. Um, did you find it? Did you I find found it? it? Can you read it mm-hmm. for me? 
Um, the, the pull quote that I had on my website, the interview host, uh, the host of the show, you love this music, the mashup music? And she wrote, I love it. And the reason I love it is because I also think it represents society, like that young man from Boston who called. But I think it represents the best of society. It's the melange that we are in this country. Different people, different music, different expressions, different thinking. And it all comes together in one piece of music. It's so exciting for me. It is the melting pot. So to me, it really represents America. Man, I hate to end a show on a, a sour note like that. Uh, my <laughs> God, if if there was ever if there was ever a moment in time that that quoted quote needed to be said about mashups right now, it's right now. Uh, if anything, I, I've I've heard similar things from uh, Adriana and Booty Mashup on on her show when she's addressing the Booty Mashup audience, talking about uh, what's going on and you know, the importance of, you know, the music that we're playing, you know, as far as, uh, as mashups to, to audiences like this, because it does really represent, you know, the ability to exist side by side, things that you just wouldn't expect to exist and work well together. But, uh, but it's true that it does. Um, I, I will go on to, uh, just give a, a quick, uh, highlight again. Uh, please go check out some dash assembly dash, uh, required, uh, dot net, uh, for all of John Nelson's archives. Again, there are Q and A's with like some seriously prominent and even some, uh, some deep dive, uh, mashup artists, as well as, uh, people like the tape Beatles and negative land and John Oswald and Steinsky, who, you know, John himself had, has booked, uh, time and time again and performed alongside in uh, some of the festivals of appropriation that uh, he hosted for many, many years, um, as well as uh, put out releases. You can check out uh, the Escape Mechanism uh, discography on Discogs uh, to see what uh, might be available that you can pick up of his. Uh, might I suggest starting with his first album here, uh, self-titled Escape Mechanism. Um, I, I will say... Uh, Dun, 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 dun. Boy, this one last thing that I want to say before I get into this last track. I'm going to leave uh, with a a, uh, uh, a track from uh, your album Emphasis Added in 2008 called Cycles. Um, this being said, your album that you put out uh, wound up, uh, you were able to get a lot of really good press on that. Um, not only were you uh, covered uh, by Pitchfork, but uh, you spun that into a, n- a number of uh, interviews on uh, prominent media networks like like NPR. Um, what was your favorite uh, as far as like, you know, when we talk about like what we consider achievements, whether that be personal achievements or things that make our parents proud or whatnot, that give that sense of legitimacy to our work, you know, uh, what would you say is your crowning achievement as far as like this is the thing that like gave me that that air of you know satisfaction i guess uh i mean aside from aside from putting out my own albums because that to me is you know, that's the that's the goal is to have enough material for a record probably when sound unseen invited me to choose my favorite sound collage artists and invite them out to Minneapolis to play at different venues. I got to invite uh, John Oswald and the Tate Beatles and um, Steve Heiss and Wobbly came out. A number of people, Wetgate put on a really interesting performance with their film projectors. I God, I hope I'm not forgetting anybody. That was 19 years ago, but that was really an exciting moment for me. That was, yeah. I feel good about that, you know. And then the following year, I got to bring out Vicky from People Like Us. And a couple years after that, Mark Hosler from Negative Land. Those, that was, yeah, that, that was uh, opportunities where I was able to use a little bit of the uh, clout, for lack of a better word, to uh, highlight some people whose work I really looked up to. One last and. thing that I want to leave everybody with before we go uh, is that in 2010, right before you uh, you you know gave it up for the family, uh, you put out an album called Fifty Fifty. Uh, 
Can you give uh, me a brief descriptor of what the concept of that album was? Mm -hmm. Yep. Since, since it was to mark the end of the show, or maybe it was to mark the 10th anniversary. I can't remember now. Was it the 10th yeah, anniversary? So, yes. Um, 50, 50, since it was to celebrate that fact, uh, the idea was that the artists I played on the show were at least 50% sample. That was what I boiled it down to. And so we were doing, a, uh, an album of 50 tracks by 50 different artists who were all expected to sample at least 50% on their 52nd tracks <laughs> and on this on this again some really prominent uh mashup artists it starts off with dj lobster dust doing a really great smashing pumpkins meets marvin gay mashup uh dj bc's on there futuro's on there stallio's on there um you were able to get it uh partially uh produced in coordination with a uh a minute was it minnesota minneapolis mnartists.org mn yeah, and got, give you a real, yeah. you know, real good uh, distribution, I guess, for that. Um, you can listen to that, by the way, on Spotify uh, if you want to look up 5050. Uh, it's the shape of a record, and this is 5050 in the center of it. Matter of fact, it's on the screen here in the co in the corner uh, and to the uh, right of John Nelson right there. You'll see that that logo. Um but that being said, uh, it was a great, and I'm going to end it with this, is that if Boom Selection really put out that manifesto in 2001 where they put on breakcore artists and, and IDM artists and just like, and sound collages and, and mashup uh, artists all together on like a three-disc three, three data set, uh, you condensed that, made your 50-50, and provided a great bookend for the, that decade with this release. So again, this is just my own. You, you can agree with me or not, uh, as far as far as the listeners go. But for me, it's the boom selections. Never mind the bootlegs. Is one side of the book end of the decade, and then the other end of the decade is, of course, fifty fifty by John Nelson. Here, uh, again, thank you so much for being on the show, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm going to uh, leave you with a track called "Cycles" from uh, his 2008 album uh, "Emphasis Added." See you next week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. An organization he founded to focus on America's youth. Buy any standard pistol or revolver and get a $25 gift certificate. Hansen is accused of passing U.S. secrets to Moscow for 15 years in exchange for cash and diamonds. They'll be repeated for you at the end of this commercial. There has to be some semblance of order. It always does. It goes in cycles. Let's go live to CNN's Jim Bitterman. He joins us now from Germany. Do you believe that everything goes in cycles? Yeah. Everything goes in. Everything goes in. Everything goes in. Everything goes in. Yeah, of course I. I do. I. But I don't. I think that each time something comes round, mm. another layer is added to it. Mm -hmm. goes in cycles yeah everything goes in everything goes in everything goes in everything goes I, yeah of course i i do i but i don't i think that each time something comes round mm. another layer is added to it mm -hmm.
based on something old, but a new direction. But now, in music, we've kind of come to an impasse. Uh, you know, the direction of rock has stopped dead. And the only one really new is someone like this now, um, who is kind of... A new direction, based on something old. Do you believe that everything goes in cycles? Yeah. Everything goes in, everything goes in, everything goes in. Everything goes in. Yeah, of course I, I do. I, but I don't, I think that each time something comes around, mm. another layer is added to it. spoke a moment ago about what your niche might possibly be in, in our musical structure. I mean... A new direction, based on something old, but a new direction. That's the marvelous thing about it. A new direction, based on something old, but a new direction. A new direction. As the times change, you want something different from your entertainment. Yeah, of course I, I do. I, but I don't. I think that each time something comes around, mm. another layer is added to it. Mm. music based on something old a new direction I mean, that's the marvelous thing about it Stop acting like an idiot and catalog those tapes like I told you to. Stop. 